subject rights communication across media boundaries, um, specifically talking about linked content coalition and rights data integration. Um, but I just wanted to give a bit of background because it struck me as I was listening to some of the other presentations and I know a little bit of what's going to come after as well, that some of this is going to sound a little bit familiar and there are in fact some common threads which are worth putting together. So although I'm listed as the um, project director of LCC, I actually work for a company called Rightscom. Um, Rightscom, if you go back, I was interesting talk to, listening to Phil, go back to the late 1990s, um, there was a project called Index which was run by two gentlemen, um, Mark Bide, um, who is now at um, Editor, and uh, Godfrey Rust. Um, if you haven't read the Index report and you're interested in media metadata, it is a seminal piece of work, and I cannot recommend it to you too strongly. From DDEX, all sorts of initiatives, from, from Index, all sorts of initiatives have been spawned. Uh, it uh, directly informs DDEX, which is the music standard. Um, it has um, informed ACAP, which ultimately led to RightsML. It informed Onyx, and the early work on Onyx PL, uh, which you heard about earlier, um, is going to lead to LCC, the Link Content Coalition, which I'm going to talk about. Link Content Coalition is already informing PLUS, which you've heard about so far today, and is going to help inform some of the work that CEPIC is doing, which Sylvie would be talking about afterwards. Rightscom has also been involved in other initiatives um, around this space. We were almost involved in the Book Rights Registry if they just hadn't quite decided not to proceed with it. Um, we are currently involved with the Global Repertoire Database, which is a music in industry initiative um, to identify owners of musical works. Um, the LCC framework is going to be informing the Copyright Hub, and RDI, which is the second project I'm going to be talking to you about, is also informed by LCC. So if some of this sounds familiar, and if some of these slides I'm going to rattle over quite quickly because they've been covered previously, that sort of gives you the context. LCC, Linked Content Coalition, was established to develop building blocks for the expression and management of rights and licensing across all media types. The idea was that rights were, rights are, actually common across media types. And that the content that we're dealing with is multimedia. We're not talking about silos anymore. We are talking about packages of content. And we need some way of deciding, if I say potato and you say potato, do we actually mean the same thing? And we felt it was possible to do this. Um, and Link Content Coalition was formed. It was um, a global coalition, um, members of all media types. Um, members of parts of the uh, digital supply chain. The first phase, which completed earlier this year, was the production of a set of documents, and I'll summarize very briefly what those documents covered. The second phase is moving on to more operational implementations, and that's where Copyright Hub um, and RDI come in. Fundamentally, though, so I don't have to say it too many times, LCC is not about automating where it isn't appropriate, which has been a theme throughout today. And it's also not about replacing existing standards. Fundamentally believe that existing standards bodies are good. The issue is they don't go quite far enough at the moment, and there is a way of actually delivering that, we believe, through LCC. I'm not certain that there's much on that slide that hasn't been said already today. Um, This is about enabling efficient supply chains. That's what we've been talking about all day. How do you create efficient supply chains where you take as much friction out as possible, but not more than is necessary? There are some points in the supply chain which will always require manual intervention, and they should be left as they are. There are other points that can be automated. If they can be automated, automate them. And I think that sums that slide very nicely. We've also talked quite a lot today about the benefits of the efficient rights data supply chain, how it can grow the marketplace, how it can increase efficiency. We touched on political arguments, and 
there is a lot of politics in this space at the moment. Certainly, um, we heard from Thomas earlier about the situation in Germany and in France. In the UK, we've had innumerable reports about the government looking to grow the creative economy and looking at expression rights, automatic rights expression as a way of enabling this. A lot of political interest in how you can enable small businesses to grow more. And we talked about the challenges. Fundamentally, that LCC was set, what LCC was set up to do was look at that one. That most standards bodies actually deal with single content silos, and that is no longer the marketplace that exists. There needs to be a way of breaking out of those silos. The original idea was that there would be four deliverables coming out of LCC. In fact, one of them dropped out service specifications at the bottom there um, is something which is going to be picked up in the rights data integration project, which is kicking off now. So I'm going to talk briefly about three of them. The first is the rights reference model. That's a single data model which represents all kinds of rights data. It's not a message schema. It's not a database schema. It isn't a rights expression language. And we can have all sorts of discussions, and we have had, about the benefits of top-down, bottom-up, and whatever order you want to do these things in. But I think you'll see, when I put the slide up, some of the issues that we've been talking about today are reflected in the work that's been done in these, do in these documents. Talked a lot about identifiers today. And you'll find that there's an identifier specification, and some of the, again, some of the issues that we've been talking about are covered in the um, identifier specification. And likewise, message specification. So this has been the focus of the work so far, those three main pieces of work. I really don't want to read all of that because I, it's there primarily because I assume that the slide pack is going to be distributed. It certainly can be. And it's there for reading um, at your convenience. But there are some interesting issues that I'd like to pull, to pull out because we've touched on them. Um, over on the far side, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. It is possible to make something too simple. And actually, again, possibly a point for discussion, I'm not certain that necessarily starting off simple is the right direction to go in. Again, on the left-hand side underneath that, can be dumbed down, but shouldn't need to be smartened up. Because we don't know where this is all going. We agree that it's probably quite simple at the moment, but where it is going to end up in, in, the, in the fullness of time is less certain. Commercially neutral. Coming back to something Jonas was talking about. We don't care whether the requirement of the rights is that someone gets paid, or that someone gets attributed, or that someone gets donuts. We really aren't interested. There's an expression of rights. There's a requirement to actually access that, the content as a result. Identifies is an interesting one because, again, we've talked about some of this already. And I promise you, I have not made these slides up since we started talking. Coming back to John's application. Um, if you've got an identifier of a party or a, or a piece or a work, it should be resolvable. You should be able to take that and you should be able to move to a place where you can securely identify who the individual is or what the work is. Because there should be that link. There is no reason why that link should not exist. It needs to be over on the left-hand side. We strongly believe that um, Descriptive metadata, you can have the option of including description, descriptive metadata in the identifier field or within the content. But rights metadata, rights metadata has to be associated by the identifier. Rights metadata is too dynamic to be associated directly with content. It changes too often. You've got to link back to somewhere where you can access the rights metadata. The rest of that I'll leave for you to read at your leisure. 
And messaging, actually, we haven't touched on much, so I'm not going to talk about it. Again, this is the sort of thing, though, that the project has been looking at. What are the ideal characteristics of the messaging that carries the information that we're talking about? I am going to talk briefly about RDI. RDI stands for Rights Data Integration. RDI is a project which emerged because of the political support of the European Commission. They were very interested in the work that LCC was doing. They wanted to support it, um, and they created a framework where we could um, run a project where a number of parties would come together, all different types of media types, all different representations of the um, value chain, and actually put into practice what we said the theory was. One of the things that we were very concerned about, and again, I think Phil touched on this, was standards are only standards because they're used. And certainly just because we call this a standard, and it's got a nice, bit of, bit of, you know, nice block of paper around it, and we think it actually makes a lot of sense, and there are some pretty pictures, doesn't mean it makes any sense to anybody else. But we wanted a test bed. We wanted to actually prove that you could take different rights expression languages, and you could transform them so that you could actually communicate across different media silos and you could create new business models. So we've got a €2 million Euro project, which is just about to kick off. EC is funding 50% of it. Um, and the objective is to demonstrate that data flows across the supply chain can actually be integrated using the work of the LCC. Very simplistically, that's what the model looks like. At the top, you have a range of organisations from four different um, media types. Broadly, we're calling them sources. That doesn't quite, as you'll see, equate to um, rights owners, because some of those organisations up there technically represent rights owners. But they are the source for us of rights data. In the middle, we have a transformation hub a mixture of technology and semantic mapping, which will enable the rights data from the top <coughs> layer to be transformed into a central format. Along the bottom, we've got exchanges, um, organizations which in our terms um, are, if you like, the transactional interface between a user and rights data. So what we're envisaging is users coming to someone like Rights Direct requesting information for a range of different media types, that information being sent in a single format to Jamaica, to the transformation hub, and then in a federated search going off to the sources to actually find the information. There's a very specific, I've got to put a hook in here, very specific piece of um, work which is going on in still images which um, Sylvie is going to be talking about earlier, which reflects the, sta the state of development of work in the still images industry. But I'll let her talk about that, and I shall keep moving on. A couple of use cases, just to give you a feel of the sort of thing that we're looking at. First is around open educational resources. Um, in this situation, we'd be talking about users being academics or universities, and the requirement being to um, combine multiple media types into a single package for distribution to students. The issue is that the granular content that they require, so extracts of books, extracts of music, audiovisual content, generates a situation where they have high volume, low value rights clearance. And it generates significant cost. There's been a project underway in the UK um, which has been running this sort of thing on a manual basis and the book publisher concerned had a significant problem just on a trial basis actually clearing the rights. So what they're looking to do is to put in place, if you like, the equivalent of that manual pro project that's just completed and put in place something through RDI which will indicate whether or not this automated clearance, this um, program programmatic clearance of rights actually generates business benefit. And finally, um, second use case that we're looking at, um, again, just to give a sense of the sort of areas that we're, we're um, exploring. The user here is a watermark embedding company. Um, their requirement is the ability to commercialize access to digital content from print. Their problem is that 
Every time they try and move from one media type to another, they need to do an extensive development of their platform because of the different languages involved. And this they perceive to be a constraint on their business model. So what they'd like to do is to have a single platform, and the single platform um, would then, through the process, the transformation process of LCC, access multiple different content types to clear the rights for the clearance. So that they're looking for a very similar sort of um, structure to the, 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 the core RDI format. 15 minutes and 12 seconds. I apologize for the 12 seconds. Thank you very much.